basically I'm uh, going, my overall presentation would be split into three major things. It would be of course aerosol centric and it would be India centric. And I will talk about the direct and indirect of if, uh, effects of aerosols. I will tell you what are those and then I will show you some uh, global circulation model results that what they are showing about the, mainly about rainfall because rainfall is an issue and during monsoon time, okay, that's one. And then, so that is in the context of anthropogenic aerosol forcing. Rajiv has already talked about that. There are certain kind of forcings of climate that if you are emitting, there are some agents, for example, greenhouse gases, that's an agent. And if you continue to emit that, it can exert a forcing on the climate system. Okay, so that is uh, one thing. And I, al I would also touch upon briefly that then there are other natural forcing. For example, you talk about volcanoes, that's a natural forcing, right? That is not because of anthropogenic activities, but I'm not going to talk about volcano as such. I will rather talk about then there are issues related to galactic cosmic rays that also people have found some very strong correlation. And then I will tell you that what is physics behind that and what the modeling results are showing, okay? So here is just to give you some ideas. Some people have probably some notions about aerosols. This is what is shown here is that clean air and in the polluted air, if you sample particles and if you just scan it or you do uh, some microscopy, that is what you are going to show. So you see that there are whole myriad of particles you are seeing here. And the overall loading is much smaller in the clean air. That kind of thing certainly over India is very hard to find. But elsewhere if you do, maybe in Harvard or somewhere, you might find like this, but in Kanpur, that would be the case, okay? So here are the three major effects of aerosol which we talk about, the climate effects. And then of course, it is very uh, much important for remote sensing because you need to do a lot of correction because aerosols are present all along in the atmosphere. So whenever you are going to do some remote sensing related to any atmospheric parameter, you have to take away the effects of aerosols, okay? And there, there is a health effect. I think in the next uh, session, uh, the subsequent speakers will talk more about that. So I will talk more on the climate effect, okay? And then when we talk about climate effects of aerosol, then there are direct effect. I will show you a cartoon that what's a direct effect. And then there is an indirect effect. That means that the aerosols are not directly impacting climate. That means they are not directly interacting with radiation because radiation is the main driver of the climate system. Rather, they are perturbing the clouds. And by perturbing the clouds, they are changing or affecting the climate system. And then in indirect effect, again, there are variety of indirect effect which has come into uh, the notice in last about a decade. And that has still been a, you can call it like a mystery to the scientists. And a lot of attention has been put towards these different kind of indirect effect and quantifying them, okay? And then of course, there is a third one which we call semi-direct effect that's basically kind of a combination of these two, okay? So here is what uh, basically we see that you have aerosols which are ubiquitous in the atmosphere, they are present everywhere. And as the solar radiation comes, and it interacts directly with the particle, either it would be scattered or it would be absorbed. And in that way, basically you are changing the radiation budget. Every layer of the atmosphere, you are changing the radiation balance. And by that, basically you are forcing the climate over a small or a long time scale. And that is what we call as a direct effect, okay? And then there are whole variety of um, ways by which it can do that, of course, if you are going to have absorbing aerosols in the atmosphere, it is going to warm that layer of atmosphere. And in that process, it could also cool the surface. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. And then there is another effect where basically when you are putting more particles, and as you know that clouds cannot form if you do not have aerosols, okay? That's a well-known thing that if you make atmosphere devoid of particles, thermodynamically, it is not possible to form or from the liquid water to basically create a droplet, okay? It is a unfeasible process in the atmosphere. And therefore, once you put more particles, it is like that you are making it congested, okay? So for a same bucket of uh, water, if you create more seed, there will be competition. 
and there will be many more small droplets getting formed and that is what the cloud albedo. So cloud albedo means that how much radiation cloud is going to reflect back and that increases as you have more number of particles as we see there. Okay. How do we use this? Yeah, just red bit. Okay. So basically if you have more number of particles in the cloud, you are going to reflect more and that is what is an indirect effect. And then there is a third one where if you have an absorbing aerosols present that we are talking a lot these days, black carbon, and because they are inside either the cloud droplet or ice particles, as they fall down, they are going to bring these species on the snow and thereby they will change the reflectance properties of the snow. And that is what we are talking there are news about the, that glaciers are changing, etc., etc. Okay. And why we are uh, bothered about all this? So IPCC has been already mentioned by Rajiv and Rajesh. What is done here is that we are interested to know this forcing. How much is this forcing because of these different agents? What are these agents? What we are showing here is that basically radiative forcing, if it is positive, we call it warming. That means it would warm the atmosphere. If it is negative, that means it would cool the atmosphere. And what is on the x-axis here is basically the confidence. So that means for each one of them, if it is high, that means we, we have a very high statistical confidence. Okay? And that has been well quantified. And if you go to very low, that means our confidence or the confidence of the international community is very low. Okay? And as we see that our confidence is very high in case of greenhouse gases. But when you come to aerosols, I'm not going to go into the individual ones, you see that our confidence by and large is still very low in regard to aerosol forcings. Okay? And when it comes to even indirect effect, as you say that, that of course is even much smaller. Okay? So that means indirect effect is a much larger challenge. Here is just to show you again by just a cartoon that what is happening, you have the total extinction that we call is as a, as a sum of scattering and absorption that happens because of variety of particles. And the colors are showing that you can have different type of particles in the atmosphere. And computations of these forcings are certainly a challenging job because you have different type of particles, you have variety of shapes, and then there is also a vertical distribution involved. So there are a lot of technical issues here which I don't want to go into that. That requires a lot of data also to be collected in order to correctly compute these forcings and hence you have seen those uncertainties which I showed in the earlier slide. Okay, now just coming to, now we can't live without showing some global circulation model results. So there always have been this, you can call um, effort and maybe uh, you can call an interest to finally predict that what would be the impact of black carbon on the Indian monsoon rainfall. Okay? And first time, I think this is the first paper what Ramanathan has done and he published in PNS, that he showed that how the Indian rainfall is going to change in the event of when you have a continued greenhouse gases or you have only black carbon emissions or you have a combination of those. Okay? And then there are lots of things. And of course, what he has also shown is that the observed data. Okay? <coughs> but the most important thing here is to note is that basically there will be a large reduction in the Indian monsoon rainfall, okay? and then there are of course controversies related to how did he define which region, which season, etc. Nevertheless, that has generated a lot of interest that because it shows that there will be a large reduction in Indian summertime rainfall as much as by 30 percent if you allow black carbon to continue to increase up to 2050. Okay? That is the basic message from this slide. And then, in a subsequent paper, he further went into the details of this. And what is being shown here is that he is a modeled result, and he tried to look further that what are the different sectors which are contributing to the total loading of aerosols. And what is being shown here is aerosol optical depth, that is a measure of the total particles present in the column. So that is from the surface to the top of atmosphere. It's a unitless parameter, but it nevertheless gives you a very good idea that how much is the total particles present. Okay? And it is very much amenable to satellite measurement. 
So what you, what you see here is that in the first one he shows that what is the total black carbon aerosol optical depth over India when you have this coming from all these sectors. Okay? Now the second one is only because of what is being burned in the household, in the many rural areas of India. And you see that if you take that out, there is virtually very little black carbon aerosol optical depth. So the message is that what he showed this first time is that there is a huge aerosol optical depth just because what is being burned in the rural household of India. So there were controversies, but of course it was again an interesting result. And then in the same paper he also has given a very nice thing here that we are again talking about the four things here. And this, there are four actually, you know, you see that there are four plots and then what they show is like this is the column. So columns are, this is basically the yellow thing is surface, everything from here is atmosphere and then you have a top of atmosphere, okay? And then there are these forcing values which he calculated. If you look first that what is showing here is that all greenhouse gases, all greenhouse gases means everything which could warm the atmosphere, every gas which has a warming potential, okay? And you see that as you go from the surface to the top, everywhere it warms. Okay, greenhouse gases everywhere warm. If you take only carbon dioxide, necessarily it will be smaller than all greenhouse gases, right? Now, on the other hand, if you come to black carbon and other type of aerosols, there is a very different thing we see here, okay? If you look at a black carbon, it is warming in the atmosphere, okay? It is also warming, so these are positive numbers. It is also warming on the top of atmosphere, but it is cooling at the surface. Okay, this is, of course, this is not first time he showed, but this is a very important result that greenhouse gases are warming the entire column, but aerosols have a differential effect. At the surface, it is cooling and elsewhere it is warming. Therefore, it has a tremendous impact on the atmospheric stability. As we all know that during daytime, surface is warm and above the surface, things are cooler and thereby, Basically, there is a temperature profile which shows that temperature decreases with altitude. But by doing that, by exerting this forcing, actually you have perturbed the atmospheric stability. And that has potential consequences for cloud formation and for the dispersion of air pollution, etc. On the other hand, if you look into other type of particles, not black carbon, that is sulfate and other type of particles. So let me tell you that black carbon, we call it absorbing because it is like a black body. Okay, it absorbs everything and then it emits. Okay, it doesn't scatter. Now, other type of particles like sulfate only scatter. Okay, so that is very clearly shown here that of course it also causes a negative forcing at the surface, which is popularly known in this area, in this literature, as a dimming. And it has a similar thing but of slightly lesser magnitude in the atmosphere. But because they are scattering, they cause a cooling on the top of atmosphere and therefore you, you know that many geoscientists have been arguing that in order to contain or basically uh, stop the global warming thing, you might have to inject a lot of sulfate aerosols or in other words, you have to create artificial volcanoes which are, is also popularly known as geoengineering, okay, nowadays. But there are lots of debates going on, okay. And then further he showed some more details about that, that what are the actually regional or spatial variations of these forcings, right? And I don't want to go into that, but if you just look into this middle, middle panel, what is shown here is the, again, the atmospheric forcing, and you find that there are hot spots and India is a hot spot, you know? That if you look at the values, India is one of the places, and particularly, you see that this strip, Indo-Gangetic Basin, is clearly coming out, you have a large forcing happening here. And if you look, look at the surface forcing, you again see that India is one of the striking places where you have lots of dimming happening, okay? This is a matter of certainly a concern, okay? If not alarming. And then he has further computed the, what would be the change in the atmospheric temperature due to greenhouse gases and due to black carbon and this is one of the most accurate calculated heating rate due to aerosols which are available in the literature okay because in this 
he has used lots of observational data in the global model to basically compute that. But the main thing is that you see that you could have on an annual basis that if you average it on a year, you could have up to up to 0.6 to 0.7 degree perturbation of the atmospheric temperature. Okay, greenhouse gases are also perturbing, but you see that black carbon is also not <coughs> far behind. Okay, now here is then then of course there is more you know interest to look into that how Indian monsoon is dynamics and ultimately precipitation is going to respond to aerosols. So what happens that there is one, this is one of the respectable model, uh, of course Rajiv has said that GCMs have lots of problem, but here is a model flaw from GFDL, Princeton University and that is regard, uh, you know, is a respected model and we are not seeing a very different results from this model simulation. So what they have done, again they have basically simulated in a historical fashion from starting from 1940 to 2000 and they have done ensemble that means that you run the model by doing small perturbations for many many runs okay ensemble means it could be 50 100 and then you basically try to look that how the mean is showing up and what is shown here is that they chose a central india that what people are still debating and they criticize them that cho they chose a very small region of india and they found that that the model predicted anthropogenic induced rainfall decrease matches very well with what has been shown by the observed data okay so nevertheless that they had a very small region but still for that region one can say that result has some credibility okay of course we can always criticize that and then they went on further to show that what is the trend that means what is the decrease or increase in the rainfall over this historical entire period which is what they say that millimeter per hour per entire time period and they found that the model that all means where all forcing is included have the measured and the modeled trends are comparing quite well okay so that was another interesting thing but of course they also commented that over china it is not comparing very well okay and then what is the scientific basis or what is the physics they put behind that so mainly what they are telling that this is what is well known in fact we know from our very big uh, you know early geographical geography lessons that there are two kind of broad circulations happen so warm air rises over equator that what we call as a headly circulation so this is what he is writing as climatology and then there is another circulation happening in the zonal direction that is in, towards the latitude and what he found out from his model or he proposed actually based on his model results that if you have the greenhouse gases and Rajesh also pointed this out that in the case of greenhouse gases you have a warming and this changes the thermodynamical considerations of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is warmer and therefore of course it can hold more water and that will somewhat would be conducive for more rainfall. Okay? But if you put aerosols it makes it very complicated. So you see that in the case of aerosols, there is an anti headly if I can call it, circulations of op circulation operating. You see that climatologically, what we know that circulation is going from equator towards pole, and now something <coughs> is actually opposing it. So in the case of greenhouse gases, you have only thermodynamical considerations playing a role, but when you include aerosols as well, they are also bringing the dynamical considerations. And that is what he puts it forward that that could be one reason that that is what would actually affect the entire monsoonal dynamics. Okay, right. Now here is some you know calculations we had from uh, of course from our own own place. Okay, I suppose it's half an hour that was mentioned in the. Okay. Huh? But uh, yeah, but I will I, I will skip. But I think that the talk was prepared. Keeping in mind half I an know, hour. I know, I know. Huh? So, I, huh? so anyway, so this was some calculations done over Kanpur and what I just want to show that if you look into the earlier forcing values from the global models, uh, you know, GCM's calculations of Ramanathan, it was up to 5 watt per meter square. But if you look at Kanpur, we have values and these are on a 5 year. So these are pretty robust values and we have as large as reduction of at surface up to 35 watt per meter square. So globally you can have a small 
forcing due to aerosols but regionally you can have very very large forcing and that is something very important to also note that regional climate impacts of aerosols could be different from the global ones okay so i don't want to go into more details there maybe i need to now skip more now i just want to show one more thing that our joint student tarun is here our joint student also did uh, some you know <coughs> aircraft experiment so we had basically dumped all kind of instruments in the aircraft and then we did some measurement to basically improve the knowledge of the heating rate which i showed that how much perturbation aerosol should cause to the atmospheric temperature okay and with all these measurements in two years what i just want to show here that i need to skip all this that we found something very interesting that we have much larger heating rate over the larger indo-gangetic basin than what ramanathan has shown over a global average basis okay we you see that that was about 0.6 to 0.7 degree per you know 0.6 to 0.7 degree per annum right per year and we are seeing here that on a day diurnal average we have sometime up to 1.6 degree celsius heating rate happening that only because of aerosols and then there is a remarkable difference between 2008 and 2009 we found that in 8 you have this maxima happening about 1.2 kilometer and then in 2009 there is a very different the maxima is actually happening at about in fact we can't say that maxima is happening because this is still uh, increasing monotonically increasing curve so probably is still we know that about 4 to 5 kilometer we have a very high or large heating rate is happening and we found that it has some very interesting relationship between the between a normal monsoon which happened in 2008 and a major drought which happened in 2009 so that is still that work is uh, going on and we are finding there are some very uh, interesting relationship between this okay now I, I don't think that I have time to look into all that. How much, realistically, how much time I have now? <laughs> Is it one minute or half a minute? One minute? Okay, all right. They so, want me to close it. Oh, oh, that's all right. That's all right. Okay, no problem. So I think I just want to touch now that there is a, this indirect effect because I have already mentioned that I wanted to talk about that. So here is the indirect effect. I already mentioned that you have more particles in cloud and therefore you can have a variety of effects, right? And this is the scale we are talking about from particles to basically raindrops, right? And what an uh, interesting thing has been, you know, found by uh, Koren et al, which I just want to show on a global basis because a global result, what he found that there are regimes of aerosol optical depth. So this, this is basically a proxy of aerosol. What he found there that there is an invigoration of clouds that if you have the aerosol optical depth below a certain threshold of 0.4 or 0.5, you would have a larger rainfall associated with that. And this he found invariably over the entire globe. He selected different regions to demonstrate it, that it is a robust result. And further what he found, that what you see here is that basically the frequency of the grids and this is the rainfall rate. And as you go from a small aerosol abundance to large one, there is a clear shift. So this is again a very, very interesting result where he showed that if you have a particular regime of aerosol optical depth, you might have enhancement in rainfall. But don't mix it what results I showed earlier, where that was a more larger scale phenomena. But on the local scale and some for particular regime, you can have some time in migration of the rainfall. So I think I will just, I have to actually stop it here. I cannot go beyond that. So if you know, there are some questions I can. Thank you.